Once again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We are in for a treat. We have author Elizabeth McAllister with us, who's going to be talking about her book, War Pigeons. Let me tell you Elizabeth, a little bit about Elizabeth before we begin. Elizabeth McAllister started her career as a marine biologist studying a deep water North Atlantic octopus. Didn't see that coming, did you? She then turned science journalism and worked at the Department of Interior and the EPA on water quality issues. McAllister writes science and history articles for magazines and newspapers on topics ranging from bridges to homing pigeons. She is also a young adult book author and the author of In Disguise, Undercover with Real Women Spies. She's additionally written another book called Reckoning at Hearts Pass, an adventure thriller in which homing pigeons play a covert role. Sounds very interesting. All right, so enough of me. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to Elizabeth McAllister. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. And many thanks to Julia Pierce and the Camden Library for hosting authors like me via Zoom so we can continue to share our stories during this pandemic. I wrote War Pigeons, Winged Couriers in the US Military, 1878 to 1957, for one reason, to move people to take a second look at the most extraordinary bird on our planet. Homing pigeons are rock doves, the same species of pigeon that perches on rooftops and wanders around parks cleaning up after us. But homers are a very special breed, a rock dove, they are strong, fast, intelligent athletes, and for three quarters of a century, they were the US military's most reliable means of communication. While we're at this slide, I'd like to mention the bird you see there, Peerless Pilot. He was one of the Navy's best couriers in World War I. In one year alone, at only 15 months old, he flew 200 missions from planes doing scouting runs out over the Atlantic Ocean back to his base on the coast of France. Peerless Pilot exemplifies the strength and the endurance that homing pigeons possess. Militaries have enlisted homing pigeons as couriers for thousands of years. One of the earliest documented occasions is of Julius Caesar using them to carry messages during his conquest of Gaul from 58 to 51 BC. His pigeon handlers might have attached a message as in this early graving, either on the tail feathers of this pigeon on the left or wrapped around a leg and tied with string as on the right bird. Homing pigeons were especially helpful during sieges when a city was surrounded by the enemy and all communications cut. During the siege of Paris, 1870 to 71, pigeons floated out of the city via balloons to a temporary government 130 miles away in Tours where they were outfitted with messages and released to fly back. In this image, the green cates, crates hold the birds being carried to the balloons. Because microphotography had been developed by then, the messages in tour were reduced to tiny bits of text which were rolled up and inserted into a bird quill and that quill tied onto a tail feather. 150,000 official dispatches and 1 million private messages were delivered by pigeon couriers to Paris. Beyond that, the birds also delivered hope, something that the besieged citizens of Paris needed badly as they were dying from um, freezing temperatures and the lack of food. The enormous and unexpected success of pigeon couriers in this siege prompted many European militaries to include them in their ranks. By the end of the 1880s, a spider web of pigeon messenger routes crisscrossed Europe. Every line you see in this map represents a pigeon route. Some even stretched across water. For example, from Spain 
into the Balearic Islands and from Italy to Sardinia. The buildup of pigeon forces in Europe did not go unnoticed in the United States. Both the Army and the Navy began to experiment with pigeon couriers. The Navy in particular was interested because out at sea, it relied on flags, whistles, horn, and gun signaling during the day and flashing lights at night. But clearly ships had to be within hearing and sight range for these kinds of communications to work. Henri Marion, a pigeon expert and French professor at the United States Naval Academy, seen here in the back row, strongly believed that ships could communicate from beyond the line of sight with homing pigeons. This was a phenomenon unheard of in our Navy at the time. In 1891, he set out to convince the US Navy Department to fund a pigeon messenger service. Sorry. There. With a few birds left over from an army loft, Professor Marion built a pigeon coat or house at the top of the Naval Academy's rigging loft, the tower on the right side of this boathouse. To demonstrate their ability to fly over water, Marion spearheaded a series of experiments taking pigeons out to sea on Academy vessels and releasing them to fly back to their boathouse loft. One of these vessels was the mighty USS Constellation, a sloop of war that had patrolled around the world and was now outfitted to train naval cadets. For a few summers, she carried a pigeon coat on her spar deck. It perched on top of the capstan, as shown here, and held a dozen or so birds while out at sea. I'm not quite sure what happened when the capstan was turned to weigh anchor, but surely the sailors placed the coat down on the deck. After five years of, of successful trials, the Navy Department agreed in 1896 to fund six lofts on the east and west coasts of the United States. This was a far cry from the 20 Marion had initially proposed, but it was a start. The lofts look similar to this one at the Portsmouth Naval Yard, all the same size and painted red and white stripes, which the pigeons could see easily from the air. Slightly different, but bearing the same shape and stripes is a loft built on the west coast at the Mare Island Navy Base near San Francisco. While the Navy lofts were being built and pigeons bought and trained, Professor Marion patented this message holder, the first to attach to a pigeon's leg. You can imagine how much more secure a message would be as opposed to tying it to a tail feather or a leg. This capsule became the prototype for the modern pigeon message holder. But Professor Marion had no idea how important his design would be. Just as the Naval Pigeon Messenger Service was getting started, we entered a war with Spain to free Cuba and the Philippines from Spanish rule. You may recall this battleship, the USS Maine, that blew up mysteriously in Havana Harbor in February of 1898, contributing to the outbreak of the war in April. Pigeons did carry messages in this war from ships off both coasts of the United States, but documentation is spotty and their use seemed to remain mostly experimental. Then in 1901, an event occurred that changed how the world communicated. Guillermo Marconi sent three dots, Morse code for the letter S across the Atlantic Ocean in a matter of seconds. By 1902, all new Navy ships were outfitted for wireless. The six pigeon coats sold off or shuttered uh, and changed to radio stations and the birds sold off. That was the end of the first official pigeon messenger service in this country. Henri Marion died in 1913 
And while he never realized his dream of a fully feathered pigeon messenger service, he did live long enough to witness the beginning of the rise of homing pigeons into legend. For in 1903, a new type of bird, one made of wooden cloth and powered by an engine took to the air. Soon after the army and Navy trained pilots to fly these planes. And it wasn't long before homing pigeons accompanied them. Pigeons were just getting started in their service to the military. Homing pigeons were especially valuable in World War I because the Signal Corps communication technology was not very functional in trench warfare. Telegraph wires were cut or trampled, and when signalmen rose from a trench to repair them, they were shot down. Radios were unreliable and could be intercepted, and the pitted, ruined terrain made travel harrowing for human and dog couriers. Homing pigeons got their messages through. About 600 birds were in the Signal Corps American Pigeon Service. This is a photo of a mobile pigeon loft that stayed to the rear lines where pigeons were raised and trained. When the troops had to move, the lofts moved with them. Pigeons were carried from their lofts to the front in baskets on the backs of soldiers and Marines, as in this photo, or on the backs of horses, mules, and dogs. This Airedale is crossing a stream with a basket of pigeons on its back. In this photo, soldiers in a trench have attached a message to a pigeon and about to release it. So think of it. Weighing in at about as much as a large apple, pigeons flew through exploding shells, gunfire, gas, and smoke, hardly wavering even when mortally wounded. This is the war where pigeons became heroes. Engineer J.L. Kearney said of the Argonne Forest Battle, nothing could live above ground and the trenches and shell holes were filled with dead and wounded. Time after time, the attack was on and almost as often repulsed. Division after division was thrown into the line to face the most deadly of modern weapons, the machine gun. With small artillery firing incessantly, high explosive shells dropping everywhere and the gas attacks on hourly, there was little wonder that man-made lines of communication should wither and break. Into the breach went the little racing pigeon, the most gallant bird the world has known. And they came through, came through with messages of weal and woe, came through when shattered troops were crying for aid, when every other line of communication had failed. And I believe the best parts of my book, of my chronicle, are the thrilling and poignant stories of these gallant birds serving alongside our soldiers and sailors, airmen and Marines. Along with machine guns, tanks were a new formidable weapon in World War I. But their noisy, cumbersome crawl didn't affect the pigeons that went along as crew. Here is a tanker on the Western Front, and a pigeon is being released out a small window at the side of the tank. While the Army and Marines fought the war on land, the U.S. Navy flew scouting missions from bases on the coasts of France and Italy. With very little training and only a compass to guide them, Navy pilots like Mayner, Earl and H. Parker from Farmington, shown here, flew rickety biplanes over the ocean looking for German submarines and ships. No pilot left without a couple of homing pigeons, which were sent back for help should a plane have to ditch in the ocean. Hundreds of downed airmen were saved by these remarkable couriers. Parker spoke of another use of his birds, when fog was encountered. Out of sight of the land with a compass rolling like a top, he said, we would release the pigeons. Of course, you couldn't follow them in a fog, but you could see them circle and rise and straight line it for land. That's all we needed to know, the direction of land. Otherwise, a lot of us would have been lost at sea. I don't wanna leave World War I without mentioning Kaiser. 
He was a German pigeon captured by American forces in 1918 toward the end of the war. Kaiser was a big, handsome bird, as you can see. He was brought back to the States along with 21 other feathered POWs and installed at the Signal Corps Pigeon Center at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. He was issued comfortable quarters as well as a mate and encouraged to breed more war pigeons. By the 1930s, Kaiser was the last surviving captured German pigeon in American custody. And despite his age, his offspring proved to be champion racers. Some flew in World War II, but this time for the Allies. On February 27, 1948, Kaiser turned 31. The children at the fort held a birthday party with Kaiser appearing as the guest of honor. That August, he was given membership in the American Legion's first retread post 667 in Los Angeles on account of his service in two wars. On January 20th, 1949, he traveled to Washington DC to celebrate the inauguration of Harry S. Truman. On Halloween night, 1949, Kaiser passed away at Fort Monmouth at age 32. He's outlived his namesake, Wilhelm Kaiser, by several years, as well as many wives. His bloodline provided the army with strong war pigeons that served in World War II, and the progeny of his great, 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 great grandchildren sold to the public when the army dissolved the pigeon service remain in lofts across the United States today, no doubt producing racing champions. Pigeons were so successful as couriers in World War I that after the war, both the Army and Navy established large breeding and training centers for birds and pigeoneers, their handlers. The Army established their center at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, and the Navy at Naval Air Station Anacostia in DC. This is Chief Henry Quebec in charge of the training at Anacostia. On this day, he's releasing birds from the Potomac River to fly back to their loss at the base. Pigeons were also released from planes as part of their training. A pilot had to be extremely careful about how and when a bird was let go, lest it be sucked by an air current into the fuselage or the wing or chewed up in the propeller. Back at their loft after a training run, the pigeons received royal treatment. Here, they are enjoying a bath outside. Inside their loft, the birds had electricity and running water, and at night, armed guards patrolled the grounds. A special hospital took care of any avian concerns. Only the most cosseted racehorses received care equal to that of the Anacostia homing pigeons. In the 1920s and 30s, military homing pigeons also flew for other government entities, including the US Geological Survey, the US Forest Service, and the Civilian Conservation Corps. They were flying everywhere. Not 30 years after the war to end all wars, homing pigeons were called up again to serve with our military. Despite huge advances in communications technology, homing pigeons were, were relied upon for backup. About 54,000 were trained in this country and 36,000 deployed. World War II was fought on four continents and homing pigeons flew with the army at every front. They carried messages across deserts, over snowy mountaintops, through jungles, and over large expanses of ocean. Here, birds are exercising from a loft in Fuda Pass, Italy. In this photo, a mobile loft, also in Italy, has been dug into the ground and camouflaged. Maybe the enemy couldn't spot the loft, but the pigeons never fail to find it. This is the actual message that Gustav, a British pigeon, carried from a war correspondent at the D-Day landings in June, 1944. 
Gustav was taken across the channel on a landing ship and released by news correspondent Montague Taylor. Gustav traveled 150 miles to the Royal Air Force loft in five hours and 16 minutes in a 30 mile per hour headwind. Due to radio silence, his message was the first word of the invasion to reach Britain. It says, we are just 20 miles or so off the beaches. First assault troops landed 0750. Signal says no interference from enemy gunfire on the beach, steaming steadily in formation. Lightnings, typhoons, fortresses, which were airplanes, crossing since 0545. No enemy aircraft seen. And Gustav was liberated at 0830. Uh, I also wanted to include this uh, slide to show you uh, what a typical uh, pigeon messenger form looked like. Sometimes the note uh, was written uh, openly, other times it was written in code. For the first time in World War II, pigeons parachuted out of planes, sometimes by themselves, floating to ground in a small crate or with a paratrooper as shown here. You can see the pigeon resting safely in a specially made vest strapped to the soldier's chest. This type of vest was developed by Ida Rosenthal, the founder of Maiden Form Brasiers. Designing soft, close-fitting pigeon vests was hardly a stretch for Ida. While the Navy rarely used pigeons on planes or ships in World War II, they included them in crews of airships and free balloons that flew off both coasts of the United States looking for enemy ships and submarines. Here, a pigeon is being released from a blimp on a training run. Again, great care had to be taken to ensure that the bird flew safely away from the vessel. Launching the pigeons while aloft was no easy feat, said a blimp pilot at Moffett Field, California. To clear the prop wash of the blimp, a crewman held the bird's wings down and then threw the critter from a cabin window much in the same manner as throwing a football. And in this photo, men who have landed in a free balloon sent up from Naval Air Station, Lakehurst, New Jersey, are releasing a pigeon to fly back to the base with location of their landing so they can be picked up. In World War II, waves began to train homing pigeons at Naval Air Stations in the United States so that male pigeoneers could deploy. Joy Bright Hancock, one of the founders of the waves, set the criteria for being a pigeon trainer. She should be a volunteer for the training, experienced in working with animals, and be able to drive a car in order to retrieve a pigeon in training status who might have lost its way. She should be able to learn diseases of birds, their treatment, as well as their care. And of course, typing experience is desirable. In this photo, a wave at a base in Santa Ana, California is inspecting the feathers of a potential warbird. During World War II, every state had a civil defense council that remained prepared in the event of an attack on the home front. Here, a member of the Lansing, Michigan Civil Defense Council is releasing a bird as part of a communications drill. Pigeons also flew for other defense organizations, including the Civil Air Patrol and the State Guards. This photo, also from the Lansing Civil Defense Council, shows how a modern messenger capsule, after Professor Marion's design, attached to a pigeon's leg. When we entered the Korean War in 1950, Radios were the Army's mainstay of communications. However, homing pigeons yet again formed the backup plan. Flying messages over difficult terrain and when other communications were useless. Some pigeons went on covert missions, parachuting with intelligence officers behind North Korean lines. 
Despite the cold weather, the pigeons in this photo are exercising and enjoying the view from a mobile loft in South Korea. I'm going to finish by talking a little bit about G.I. Joe, one of America's most famous warbirds. In World War II, he flew for the Allies in Italy. An air attack had been planned to subdue German presence in the village of Covivecchia, but the 56th London Infantry had advanced quickly and already secured the village. With the air attack about to commence, the infantry was in danger of being bombed by friendly fire. G.I. Joe was hurriedly released with a message to call off the attack. He flew the 20 miles in 20 minutes, reaching Allied lines just as the bombers were revving their engines. His swift flight saved the lives of at least 100 Allied soldiers and many civilians. After the war, G.I. Joe returned to Fort Monmouth, where he retired to the exclusive Churchill loft meant only for heroes. In 1946, he traveled to London, where he was awarded the Dickin Medal, the Great Britain's Victoria Cross for animals. Between 1943 and 1949, the Dickin Medal was awarded to 54 animals, 36 of them homing pigeons. G.I. Joe is the only American pigeon to have that honor. And here he is being held in London by an official with the medal around his neck. In 1955, a young pigeoneer named Tommy DeRosa was stationed at Fort, Fort Monmouth and along with other pigeons, he cared for G.I. Joe. In this photo, Tommy is holding the famous bird in front of Churchill Loft. In 1957, the pigeon and breeding program at Fort Monmouth was closed and most of the pigeons sold off at auction. Writing later in the Army Communicator, Major Ron Frayne described the event. Fort Monmouth looked like a Rolling Stones concert. Pigeon lovers and breeders started to arrive at 2 a.m. to purchase the 1,018 birds that were to be sold. At $5 a pair, a person was allowed to purchase one to five pairs of birds. All the birds were gone by 11.43 a.m. And hundreds of bird fanciers went home without so much as a feather. The heroes from Churchill Loft went to zoos around the country. G.I. Joe and his mate were welcomed at the Detroit Zoo where he lived until the ripe old age of 18. But G.I. Joe's story didn't end at Detroit. On November 15th, 2019, at the Rayburn House on Capitol Hill, the newly established Animals in War and Peace Bravery Medals were presented to honor American war animals. Two living dogs received medals while well, three more dogs, two pigeons, and one horse received them posthumously. 64 years after serving at Fort Monmouth, Tommy DeRosa was there to receive the medal for G.I. Joe. And here he is standing next to Joe with his new medal. I got to meet Tommy a couple of years ago in Connecticut, where he lives and still raises and races homing pigeons. I asked him about G.I. Joe and his heroic flight in Italy. Tommy said G.I. Joe was a good bird, but that any other well-trained pigeon could have made that flight that fast. G.I. Joe just wanted to get home. I'll end there and I'll be happy to answer uh, any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was as fantastic and surprising and interesting as I had hoped it was. And we already have some questions that have come in. So let's just jump right into them. Um, Dan says, was the military your main source of research for the book and were passenger pigeons used to carry messages? Uh, okay, well, first I'll talk about the, the passenger pigeon part of that question. Um, passenger pigeons were an entirely different uh, species of bird, um, one native to North America, and uh, the rock dove came from uh, Europe and the Middle East. And the passenger pigeon 
uh, as many of you know, was once so um, uh, so popular popular uh, that it would, uh, when it migrated, it would blacken the sky um, for three days straight. You couldn't see the sun. And um, because it was uh, over harvested and we cut the forest down where it uh, lived and nested and ate, it, it then became extinct. I believe it was 1914, the last passenger pigeon died at the Cincinnati Zoo at 1 p.m. I think September 1st. Wow, <laughs> that's incredible that you remember all that. Yeah, uh, I, I, I might, I, I think that's right, but I, I, I don't quote me, I would have to double check that, but uh, I believe so. Um, so they are two completely separate um, species of birds, very distantly, very, very distant cousins, very distant. Um, about the sources, uh, yes, most of the sources I used uh, were um, from military records. Um, I was, uh, um, some of the army handbooks were online. Um, the first um, handbook that was written in 1897 um, by the Navy um, about keeping and raising homing pigeons. That was the fish, uh, first official handbook that was online. And then it was updated again in 1918. And I, I was lucky enough also to um, be able to read some um, uh, diaries and some um, memoirs online. I read a diary by a pigeoneer named Frank Hawk, and he was a pigeoneer in Europe. And I was also able to read a couple of memoirs, one by a pigeoneer in Europe, but another by a pigeoneer who had uh, served in North Africa where many, many, many homing pigeons flew in, nor in North Africa. And then, of course, the very best, as, as um, some of you might know, or if some of you have tried writing as well, the very best source of information is from people themselves. And of course, my time I spent with T Tommy DeRosa, the um, um, pigeoneer I met, uh, was just, um, just invaluable. Um, talking to people like him really brought the stories to life. I can imagine, and I, I'm, I'm, I can only imagine that those diaries must have really given yes. some very amazing insight into yes. the experience of working with those birds. Yes. Um, MJ asks, did female and male birds fly for the military, and how did they know where to go? Yes, both males and females flew, and, and they knew where to go because they were trained. First, they were trained here in this country and they were trained to um, stationary lofts. There were several uh, training centers around the country. And so they were trained as a very young bird, a few weeks old. They were taken out, once they could fly, they were taken out maybe just a half a mile away and then they could see their loft and they would fly back. And then they were taken out farther and farther and farther away. And once they got that down, they were then trained from a mobile loft. And at first the mobile loft didn't move very far, maybe, I don't know, a couple hundred yards, but then the mobile loft was moved around and farther and farther away. And the pigeons figured out how to find it and get home to it. Once they could do that here, then they were ready to be shipped uh, over to Europe where again, they were trained to fly behind lines from mobile lofts. And, uh, and mostly they, they, they were trained and flew from mobile lofts um, over in Europe. And the interesting thing is over there, they were trained more for their intelligence uh, than they were to fly fast because sometimes that mobile loft would suddenly have to move. And the, um, you know, a, di um, a division or a, a, pl a platoon suddenly was called elsewhere and the mobile loft would be gone while a pigeon was out on a, a mission. So, so that the pigeon would, you know, do its thing and fly home and there'd be no, ho no house there. 
And so, so the bird would fly around and fly around and look and not panic and not go, oh, well, uh, I'm going to go somewhere else. Um, and eventually the, the bird would uh, find its, its loft. And that's, that's what they train the birds for, to be um, reliable. Um, were there any other types of birds? I know that crows are another, um, you know, notoriously intelligent species. Uh, were there any mm -hmm. other types of birds that were used in addition to homing pigeons or? Not that I, I, I'm aware of. They did train um, falcons to hunt them down. Oh, okay. Um, mm -hmm. And both, uh, both sides trained falcons to um, kill the other side's <laughs> pigeons. Yeah, that was actually part of something I was thinking about when you were talking about the, the pigeons coming out of the trenches. Um, did it become a pretty commonplace for those pigeons to be, you know, used as targets as, as people, as they were seen coming out of the trenches? Were they often shot down? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. They very often were. And, uh, or they were very, very often, if they weren't killed, they were very, very badly wounded. But, um, they are remarkably resilient and there's story after story after story about how they, um, well, Cherami is an example of a famous World War pigeon who arrived back at its loft after being shot and through the breast and so on and the leg was dangling and, um, <laughs> you know, he lived and uh, for, for a while and they seem to be so resilient that even though they're near, near death, they will get home. And um, there's been a lot of stories about them getting back to their loft and, and dying of exhaustion or from their wounds, but not, not until they got home. Wow, that's, that's impressive. Um, it, it, it is, it's amazing. Uh, we have another question from Sue. It says, you used 1878 as the start, and yet from what you just said, it was really after 1900 that the military started to use the birds. Why? Um, well, the army actually uh, experimented with homing pigeons in 1878 when they were fighting uh, uh, American Indians out on the frontier. Um, but the experiments mostly failed because the birds weren't very well trained and uh, the pr prairie falcons were uh, a, a menace that just um, got them all the time. Um, so uh, the experiments out west didn't, didn't really go very well. Um, until 1881, um, the army had a, um, a barracks at Key West and um, they flew homing pigeons um, out of there. And they actually had a lot of luck flying them uh, from Cuba back to their barracks um, uh, at Key West. And uh, they didn't have any trouble training them over water, which was the issue that, that the Navy had. How are these birds gonna fly over water? Um, but that program was shut down um, because the, that part of the Signal Corps that was training them morphed into the Weather Service under the U.S. Department of Agriculture at the time. And so um, the homing pigeons, then that's how P Professor Marion got the birds in uh, 1890, 1890, 1891. He got them from the Army barracks. So, Early on in 1878, there were experiments with them that just didn't really go anywhere. Okay, thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, Joanne asks, do you know where the birds were raised during World War II? My grandfather raised them on North Haven Island during that time. Did he really? Well, that's very, very interesting. Um, they were raised and trained at a lot of military bases around this country. Um, Fort Monmouth was one. And then during World War II, Fort Crowder in Missouri. Um, there were a lot of them. Uh, Baltimore, Fort Meade, I believe, had some. Um, a base in South Carolina did. There, there were a lot of bases around the country that trained uh, homing pigeons during World War II. 
I don't think they uh, were training them. Your, the, this grandfather must have raised them for um, his own pleasure. Is that true? Um, if you could go ahead, uh, Joanne, and comment maybe a little further down, I can get back to that. It says that, that her grandfather raised them, raised is the word mm -hmm. that she used. Mm -hmm. um, we can move on to Judith's question. She asks, could you please comment on pigeon racing today? Ah, um, uh, I, I'll comment on what I, I, I know about it. Um, it. It's not something uh, I studied a lot, but uh, I think it's 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 thriving. There was a time when um, uh, people felt that it was a, a dying sport, and it's not that very popular up here in Maine. There's only a couple of racing clubs here, um, but there is there there's more in Massachusetts. They seem to be clustered more around um, places where. Uh, 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 immigrants from Europe settled. So New York and New Jersey, um, uh, the parts of the coast of, of uh, Massachusetts had them, um, uh, Rhode Island, New Providence, those um, towns had a lot of them. Um, I think it was in 20, maybe this past fall, I'm not sure of the date, but a, a racing pigeon, a Belgium racing pigeon was just bought by a Chinese fancier for $1.9 million. Oh my goodness. Wow. So, yeah, so it's not a dying sport in, in many countries. And um, I also have read with the influx of um, uh, Asian uh, immigrants in this country, they are keeping the sport going and um, renewing the, um, the, the interest in it that has faded. And there are also a lot of groups, the American Pigeon Racing Union is the, um, is the association to which they all belong. And there's a lot of effort today in getting y young people uh, interested in um, raising and racing homing pigeons. So I think it's it's um, it's well. I think it's it's healthy and well. Well, I think certainly that uh, you know your young adult book that we mentioned at the beginning of the program is a great way to introduce younger folks to um, homing pigeons in general, and and mm -hmm. the pigeon is the as the noble species that we weren't so you know familiar with. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, speaking of books, I want you to talk a little bit more about um, where we can find your book. Where is it available? How can how can we learn more about this book? Sure, um, you can uh, order the book uh, from um, McFarlane uh, Publishers itself, or you can just order it through your local bookstore, which I, uh, I encourage, or um, you can get it fr from Amazon. Excellent. And you can also ask your local library to um, purchase it for their collection. We absolutely will. <laughs> as a done deal. Um, we had another question. Oh, actually, Joanne is, has typed a bit more into the chat box. She says, I was a small girl, but I saw them and he told me that he was raising them at a farm where he worked in the summer and one of our island summer people for one of our island mm -hmm. summer people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, it sounds like it was a raising situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Perfect. And I actually had one last question on here. Again, if anyone else has a question, um, we're going to wrap up very shortly, but go ahead and type it in um, before we end. Um, I wanted to know, were multiple pigeons released with the same message just in case something happened to a pigeon? That, that, that's a very good question. And yes, usually two were okay. with the same um, message. And again, especially if it were in code. Okay. Yeah, I was surprised at the, the just vast quantity of information that could be fit on that yes, form that you put Yes, up. yes, oh, yes. I, I didn't yeah, expect that, that at all. That, yeah, that war correspondent wrote quite a lot. Yes, I was yeah. envisioning a you know fortune cookie size thing, one sentence, and no, a little... <laughs> no, no, <laughs> right. very impressive. I, I feel quite enlightened after after seeing that. Um, yes. So yes, once again, folks, I wanted to mention that we have recorded this program this evening, and I highly encourage you to share this amazing talk with your friends and family because. Um, I know I learned a lot and I hope you all did too. Um, Elizabeth McAllister, thank you so much for being with us tonight. This was a great joy and I'm glad that we had so many people turn out. Well, you're very welcome. And um, I, I hope at least, I, I hope you all will never look at a pigeon the same way again.
And please let me know next time you come out with a book and we'll have you back again to do a talk because this was All fantastic. Right. All right, thank we've you so much. a lot of comments in. Thank you. Thank you so much. People really thank seem you. to have enjoyed it. Take care, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Good night.